So, um, I'm going to be talking about influx spout. So this is kind of ties quite nicely into the last talk. So it's going to be about um, a case study about building a high performance message router with Go. So um, it's maybe slightly higher level than last one, but there's still a few nice bits of code in the end. Uh, so uh, I'm Olli Pekka Lehto, or just Olli for short. That might be easier. Uh, I'm production engineer here at Jump Trading. Uh, originally from Finland, uh, been at Jump for one and a half years, and I work in uh, kind of different areas, primarily our metrics stack, uh, a lot of Linux stuff, stuff and uh, high performance computing, and my background is largely in uh, managing uh, very large high performance computing systems, and uh, you know, along that working, uh, doing some coding with C, Perl, Python, and yes, even Fortran, which I think is a quite a nice language, actually. Uh, and uh, well, since starting working at Jump, uh, one of the perks is that I get to go work with Go, and that's really one of my favorite things these days. So, um, so um, at Jump, we have a lot of servers, uh, switches of applications, all kinds of interesting hardware and it's very geographically distributed. We're also very, uh, we have a very high velocity, so we, we get new servers, we uh, decommission them, move them around, a lot of new applications get that all, all the time. So monitoring, keeping track of all, all of that is quite difficult. And uh, what we use um, to monitor it is the tick stack. So uh, Telegraph, InfluxDB, Chronograph, we actually don't use that, we use Grafana and uh, Capacitor. Uh, how many people have heard of this uh, stack, tick stack? Few, few. So um, it's quite popular for doing monitoring and the nice thing is that it's all Go based. And so basically we have a host sitting here. Uh, it has a telegraph collector. It chips data from the host itself, from applications that are running on it. and external devices like, for example, switches. So some hosts act kind of as an uh, aggregator for the data. The, it gets pushed over the network to InfluxDB, which is a time series database which stores it. And then we have capacitor, which uh, can do analytics on the data and actually also push it back to InfluxDB, but also do like primarily do alerting on, on the time series data. So if we, if we see like a disk starting to fill up, uh, we, can, we can trigger our alerts based on that and do like a lot of very sophisticated stuff as well. And then for visualization, we have Grafana. And I, I'm pretty sure like most of you have seen this Grafana dashboards somewhere. So, you know, it's all good. Um, you know, we can even do things like, you know, in, on the, in the shell, just do a echo you know, me measurement name, some count equals 10, and that get, and uh, send it to just the local host UDP port where you have a socket listener for Telegraph. Uh, Telegraph adds some metadata, uh, for example, host name, location, you know, it can be a data center, business unit, whatever, and a nanosecond timestamp. And uh, with this enriched data, it goes into InfluxDB. So that, I think, really democratizes our metric stack. So basically any of our users who has an application can pretty much push any data into our uh, metric system. Uh, so people really love it. That's the good news. The really bad news is that, you know, yes, go ahead. Does that mean you got rid of Navios? Uh, well, it kind of complements it, so it's, this is, Oh, okay. Or the, the Nagios, 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 we don't, yeah, we, we, we have a Nagios style system, but it doesn't really, hasn't supplanted it yet. Oh, okay. So, so this is more, let's say, capacitor is more for, um, you know, if, if we have a trend we see uh, from the measurement data, we analyze that and, you know, the Nagios type, you know, is it working, is it, is it up or is it down, that's kind of a different issue and then there's the whole like log analytics which is a third kind of 
third uh, leg of this whole thing. And I love, I, love I love this topic. I could talk all night about <laughs> metrics and monitoring. Yeah. But yeah, I, I want to get to the go yes. part. So this is kind of the introduction part. So bear with me. It's going to be, you know, there's going to be some go stuff. <laughs> but I need Make sure that you not start talking about Gladio. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a G and a O. Oh, not <laughs> So as you see, we're starting to get a huge amount of hosts. That not, that's not all our servers, definitely not all our switches. <laughs> that's just a representative thing. And uh, a lot of internal customers using stuff, people sending uh, increasingly high cardinality metrics, which means that there's a lot of, you know, a lot of index keys in the data, which produce a lot of individual series inside InfluxDB, which then puts pressure, as you can see, in the InfluxDB, poor InfluxDB is sweating there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we have metrics with different service level agreements. Some metrics are super important. Some are more like throwaway, different retention policies, things like this. And also, you know, we have nice users, but, you know, sometimes they send just absolute junk there. And, you know, once you have junk in your InfluxDB, getting it out can be kind of difficult and also just having you know people we want people to experiment with stuff and uh, you know sometimes if an experiment goes wrong they you know we get a ton of data I, I do it as well so I'm, I'm just uh, talking so what we really wanted is this kind of magical message bus which sends things based on some config management scheme to a bunch of InfluxDB servers things which we haven't checked kind of like a QA and prod thing, so things we don't check to a junkyard, and then we graduate them to these uh, proper InfluxDB instances, which then, you know, we can, we can set up arbitrary metrics groups. And we also have a bunch of capacitor instances running there on the side. So, you know, it's a magic uh, pony that kind of poops the metrics out, eats them from the host. Uh, and now, um, let's see. So, uh, we started developing this thing called Influx Pout. So, initially, it was the sort of a monolithic application you were talking about. So, single process, it was using Go. We parallelized with Go routines. It worked fairly nicely. We had limited scalability, though. And if we shut it down, you know, it was a bit disruptive. And we, we did have high availability using Keep Alive D, but you know, overall, fairly clunky. Uh, version 2, we started thinking a bit more about like, you know, message bus. At that time, there wasn't really a nice solution to it. So we basically did this very hacky thing where you know, we used the multicast as a message bus. And we actually had it on a single server where we had it running on loopback. And you know, that kind of worked. And we manage all the components with this uh, thing called Supervisor D, which is a bit nicer than System D for, for this kind of work where you have a lot of components. And we could add listeners, we could add writers uh, to it. But you know, we were starting to see some drops with bursty data. Uh, we, there's the limitation that if we want to expand it to multiple servers, we need to be in an environment where you have you know, multicast working consistently, which, you know, if, you, if you're running like things like Kubernetes, you know, that might, might not be there working as you'd like. And also, you know, we'd had like one case where there was that multicast leak where actually the backups started to listen to the production traffic and we got double writing mm. <laughs> because they were on the same subnet. Mm. That was slightly embarrassing. But, you know, it was, we caught it very quickly and, you know, no damage was done. So, NATS, uh, that came along. And uh, then we kind of decided, that, okay, we'll do a third iteration of this thing. And uh, you know, as you know, said, it's a simple lightweight messaging system. We have a nice publish subscribe messaging model, and we're using the standard mode. There's, so there's also this NATS streaming, which enables reliable delivery, but we basically are still doing this metrics kind of on a best effort basis. Uh, a lot of our collection is actually on UDP. Uh, but we, we find that we get, you know, very few drops, so this is fine for us. And there's also a nice Kubernetes operator available where you can build clustered NATS instances inside Kubernetes, which is nice. Uh, so I'm not going to go into NATS too much because that was covered really well, thanks. Uh, 
that was a perfect talk to uh, proceed this one. So, you know, here's just an example of, you know, Nat's published subscribe model. So we have the publisher, which publishes on something called a subject. And uh, then subscribers can subscribe on this subject and the message gets replicated to all the subscribers. So what our InfluxBot version 3 looks like is that we have the listeners that get, take the metrics, either UDP or HTTP, publish them to the NATS bus. Then we have a component called InfluxBot filter, which takes this ingress, filters it according to different, uh, uh, you can have different rules, but we basically typically use the rule that one measurement, so a measurement might be, you know, MySQL metrics, CPU metrics, they get put into their own subjects. We could regex based on things like data center as well. But, and then, then the filter also removes bad timestamps, which, which has been quite annoying. And then we have the subscribers. So for example, for capacitor, we have a thing that parses the, you know, capacitor has this domain specific language called a tick script. So we actually have a, has a, thing, have a thing that parses the tick script and then you know, does a custom writer and uh, capacitor instance in, inside our Kubernetes uh, cluster. So you know, that way we can quite you know, simply dynamically set these kind of capacitor endpoints up. We can set up influx DBs. You know, this one takes MySQL and CPU measurements. This one just subscribes the MySQL and they get, uh, they get nicely into the influx DB. So it's kind of a wrapper wraps the nets which is at the heart with this uh, influx stack and makes it makes it a lot nicer and manageable uh, some performance metrics I took today so we're getting uh, so this green one is the incoming me messages and this the outgoing and we are getting about 4,000 ish messages per second we're outputting about 25,000 but they're pretty big big messages so the incoming message rate is a bit over 100 megabytes per second and the outgoing is 300. So we're basically doing like one to four. So we have, in, on average, every packet that comes in gets sent to four different influx DB or analytics endpoints. And as you can see, the performance is quite marvelous. So the load, it's a typical Intel Xeon Broadwell server. The load is very low. And the memory usage of the NATS server is absolutely ridiculous. So this megabyte, so it's under, it's like 35 megabytes. So that's, that's beautiful. And the writers are very efficient as well. So, load average. so this load average, one minute load average. Um, so it's, uh, we, we, we've found that we have plenty of overhead and this is just using one uh, NATS server. Um, <coughs> So yeah, I, I will, I'm a big fan of NATs. Is there so any way of load balancing it if you ever get to levels where you see drops? So yeah, well, as can be seen, we can cluster the NATs so it supports, you can quite easily cluster multiple instances. So now we're, now we're starting to use that. We're, we're also moving now from traditional big iron to Kubernetes. So there we have a bit more headroom and possibility to play, play around. And we can do things like, you know, we have multiple listeners and they also all have affinity to one of these NAT servers and then the NAT servers have anti-affinity. So all of, you know, these are exist physically in different servers. So, you know, you can do very cool stuff with this, you know, also like this microservice type environment. Another subject I could talk about for a very long time. Uh, but yeah, so some, some lessons we've learned along the way so one thing that's been a pain is low consumers. Have you seen this? Yes. So, you know, sometimes InfluxDB gets a bit slow. So you might have things like database compactions running. You might have heavy queries hitting the back end uh, from Grafana, someone wanting to see the data for, you know, last two years or whatever. Uh, you might have this high cardinality metrics causing some havoc, um, you know. Any, you know, bunch of things. So the, the symptom is that the buffers become and stay full. And that, you know, if that's left unchecked, it can propagate all the way through to pretty much, you know, where the metrics are collected. And you know, one, one nice thing is that because we collect UDP, you know, it, we don't get all the way to the clients that send the stuff. It, it stops there. 
but you know we we get a very high memory footprint and one thing that we kind of did initially to combat this is add deeper and deeper buffers but the thing is that if you have things that are you know perpetually slow consumers you know that buffer gets backed up and because if it's a you know go uh, channel it's FIFO so you just have this big latency so you get some stuff dropped and the stuff that happens to come in it just is late constantly. Time for Kafka. <laughs> Kafka does this very well. It does. Yeah, we were considering it, but we kind of. Nets, Nets is if you're slow, I'll kick you up. Well, yeah, that, and Nets, ha Nets has the alerting for slow consumers, so you can alert Kafka on the server and. Does, does this very well. Yeah. We're not seeing this anymore that much, though, okay. so we kind of we managed to fix it on the server side. And one thing is that because we shard the influx DB is to you know smaller units we can prevent you know one influx DB becoming slow which is I think you know the real way to solve this but that said that's good that's good to know if, if that never happens so because Kafka while it's nice you know I've understood that it's big bit of a beast it's I haven't really used it and GRPC. yeah and but that's uh, yeah it's a beast yeah and it's not it's not programmed in Go, so that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's boo, it's boo. <laughs> no, yeah, but, I, I, but yeah, that was a valid alternative. But right now, you know, we're, we're totally happy with Nats. So, uh, but one, one thing is that, you know, constantly monitoring buffer size is important. You know, keeping the buffer size is reasonable. Uh, you know, just, you know, if the data is not super important, then just think about dropping everything on the floor if it gets too full and then testing for slow consumer tests and like you know having just some you know mock up of an influx db backend that gets slow and running running tests against that so i wish that we you know been smart enough to do that in the beginning <laughs> uh, logging and monitoring so comprehensive instrumentation is essential as i mentioned like for example for these slow consumers uh, one good tip if you do this kind of high message rate stuff is avoiding any logging on the message path. So you don't want to get 100,000 times a second a log message, the message X was dropped. That's terrible. Uh, you know, you might want to add a debug mode that shows that, but you know, even then you, know, you should be a bit smart about what that logs. Maybe having several levels of debug modes. And just having an out of band monitoring. So the nice thing about Go is that with a Go routine and a channel you can very nicely implement, you know, a monitor that's out of band and now we're actually moving it to a separate monitor component. Uh, also having good tooling to investigating data path, like end-to-end -end data path issues. So now there's a NAT stop utility. We wrote our own influx pout tap, which is kind of like influx DB, uh, no, influx, TCP dump, but to just uh, look, at, look at what's going on in a, in a single subject. And there's the link, it's like super, it's super simple. So it's a good example of, you know, how to write a very simple consumer of this NATS bus and of course the TCP dump for looking, looking stuff on the network level. So, uh, and we're also moving this now to Kubernetes as I mentioned. So truly having a metrics as a service, uh, being able to dynamically create these instances, uh, ultimately even by our end users, uh, you know, doing a Kubernetes version of a Go program, you know, some of the things on the checklist, I don't know, have people migrated stuff to Kubernetes a lot. Yeah. One? <laughs> so does this look sense? Yeah. So, so just, uh, you know, ensuring that you, you have a capa capa capability to log to standard out. We want to keep things stateless, so we're thinking about implementing an API to be able to do reloads while the, while the components are running. But basically because Kubernetes handles that for us, just keeping things nice and stateless, you know, if you want to reload something, you just restart a component, you know, kill the pod, have it come up. Or, you know, because Kubernetes also handles rolling updates under the hood, you know, that seems simple. Instrumenting prom with Prometheus, that sounds a bit funny because we're actually, you know, yeah. ingesting Telegraph data. But, you know, to be honest, you know, Telegraph might not be the best thing in the world for everything. So uh, we, we do have and we will have a lot of stuff that we're not going to put into Kubernetes, you know, like, I don't know if ever, but not, you know, in a very, very long time. But, you know, the stuff that's in uh, Kubernetes, you know, Prometheus is a very good choice. And here's the 
PR that you know we're working on it. And also just having liveness and readiness probes. Sometimes if you have a web, in, like you know some web utility, you get that for free, having an HTTP endpoint that you know just reports 200 rep response. But you know in some cases like our UDP listener, you, you don't you can't really call the UDP port for health, so you need to add that in. So I guess you know fairly simple, and you know with Go it's just really easy to just mig migrate stuff to Kubernetes. Uh, so rolling you're rolling your own uh, methods using some standard stuff. So you know things you know sometimes we've found that it's worth it. So we do a lot of string processing in uh, at, uh, and we want high performance. So we found that until Go 1.10 appending strings is something that we could do with our own custom method much faster than you know what. Go offered. Another one is timestamp filtering. One counterexample is that you know, initially we, we set up this very fancy buffer recycle. There's the blog post. Uh, you know, ultimately, at least in version 3, it turns out that the garbage collection is good enough for our needs, so I don't know. I mean, do people actually do people actually do these custom buffer recyclers and stuff like that? No. Okay, yeah. Just like a lot of extra complexity. And it's just like this, you know, you know we, we see the scaling issue. Which might not be there. Uh, so you know, one one thing is that just you know, not en over engineering up front, but just having to stress test to validate these things early enough. Premature optimization is bad. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, this is just an example of uh, one thing we did. And actually, you know, I ran against Go 1.10. They have the strings builder, which does this uh, is essentially. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, we compared. You know, appending a string with sprintf, and it's about this 211 nanoseconds per operation, and with uh, our custom line builder is 119. It's yep, and I think I, I test run it now with the strings builder this afternoon, and it's about the same performance as the new one. But the thing is that this didn't exist until recently, so, and there's the gist where you have the benchmark, so you can test it out. Uh, Another one is this fast time stamps con convert, and this I think you know, will be the fastest implementation for a long time, because we're just interested in timestamps. So we can, you know, as you can see in the comments, we can just you know, assume that input is a byte instead of a string. We only support base 10 and only positive values, and you know you can do a lot of additional optimization because we're dealing with nanosecond timestamps, but we're only interested in. Uh, the second resolution, or tens or hundreds of seconds, when we want to filter out incorrect timestamps. Uh, but you know, at some point, I, I think with this we already managed to drop the overhead down from 14% to 3%. So you know, this is this is an example of where it pays off to do like a custom custom function uh, method. And uh, one thing is also things like uh, vendoring. So know instead of vendoring in the whole influx DB if there's just you know one you know method you want to use just you know drag it in uh, and copy it Have I don't you tried writing in go assembly uh, no that's I think you are a prime candidate for this oh yeah you hey. like a heavy duty optimizer <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean this is uh, yeah it's, but you know this this is now fast enough that said you know the code is available online you know if someone wants to give it a shot, you know, making it faster, I, I don't mind. So, uh, you know, overall, in conclusion, you know, Go has been a very good fit for this project and this kind of uh, moving to this microservices model. And, you know, the key things is having, having you know, with being able to parallelize individual components with these Go routines, having this H, uh, robust HTTP server, having efficient garbage collection, uh, being able to keep the code really simple while getting the job done. I think that's, that's the thing. You know, the, the line count is quite small, and I don't think we've ever had to do anything very convoluted to get things working. And al also, the surrounding ecosystem is all Go-based. Nats is great, but, you know, and uh, you know, these high volume data flows have some interesting challenges. You know, there's probably more that our other devs can tell. Uh, and uh, you know, stress testing is very useful. And uh, here's the URL. This is actually the first project 
that our company has open source completely. So, and uh, we're really you know excited to see what people think of it. And we're uh, we have some job openings. I think right now in the Singapore office, there's a spot open for a C++ developer, and uh, we have a couple of external contributors that I like to credit who have been subcontracting on this. And uh, you know, we love PRs. Here's my uh, Twitter handle. Thank you. Question. Yes. Why did you write it in C? Well, the ecosystem is all Go-based. Yeah, but I'm, I'm yeah. I was super tempted to write this in C, but yeah. I, I think ultimately you sort of made the right choice, and it would be kind of nice if this would ever be in you know, upstream as well, so that. You it, it's not cross-platform, so you don't need ghost portability. Yeah. And C is a lot easier to optimize. If you uh, handle your own man memory management. Yeah, but you know, looking looking at you know it's after, good after the fact, yeah, and it, it's been like very educational experience also doing this. So I, I, I think uh, and being being able to you know scale and do like multi-threading very quickly also on, on the all the nodes. So that's uh, that's been quite fun. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Uh, at the beginning, you said uh, you have uh, geographically distributed services. Yes. And I have one question. How is your solution uh, working with multiple uh, data centers, which can be geographically distributed? <laughs> Maybe in one in the United States, another one in Singapore? So in practice, we haven't found that a problem. We have found good connectivity between all our data centers. but. No, you could technically do a multi-tiered solution where you have local NATS servers, and you know they, they talk to each other, or you know, so so you could you could build a hierarchy. But even with a fairly distributed uh, architecture, you know, it's it's been pretty good. So to be clear, you're connecting from a remote location. So you're connecting to a remote NATS cluster in in the general case. Yes. Wow, that's brave. Or well, all the all the nets, all the infrastructure, that infrastructure is local to a to a Kubernetes cluster. So the but, but the met metric stuff is coming from all over the place. The listener could be in Los Angeles, for example, and the nets cluster could be in Singapore. Uh, technically, yes, but basically, what what we do is actually this this whole infrastructure is in the same. Ah. I think we've tried it also. So how does the metrics come in? Uh, with HTTP and UDP, so InfluxDB line protocol. From remote locations. Yeah. And one thing that these writers also do is that because the metrics are quite small, the UDP stuff has a max MP of 1,500. Uh, you know, if all would come to the InfluxDB directly, that would be pretty crazy. So they uh, so aggregate UDP aggregate the stuff into big requests. With no error correction, no error checking, no reliability. Well, we do. Well, <laughs> ultimately, we do it here in the kind of the capacitor and the analytics side. So if we're dropping stuff, we see it. But it's been it's been you know pretty solid, and you know, our network team is excellent as well. So you must trust your network a lot. We do trust <laughs> our network with our life. Yeah. Yes. You said you get timestamps. That means you're talking about if you see like a timestamp is actually uh, lesser than what you already is the latest timestamp. Well, it when it goes enough into the past or into the future, and kind of, that's kind of sometimes difficult because some. Uh, users want to push old data, so they calculate some old data and push push it. So that might be from you know last week or something. So, but typically the worst things we see is that someone sends a timestamp. You know, they explicitly define it because then if you explicitly define it, Telegraph doesn't add it. So if you explicitly define it as seconds or milliseconds instead of nanoseconds, you know, you get data that's from 1970. So. Uh, that, that can you know, cause a bit more issues, all kinds of weird shards showing up in, in proximity. So this kind of, this helps keep things clean. Mm -hmm. All right. Amazing. Thank you.